Honestly, one of the coolest things about Monster Hunter is the ability to take a monster and then make it different. I, I, I should probably elaborate more. Subspecies, variants, rare species, deviants, all the extra ways you can take a base monster that we love and turn it up to 11, flip it on its head, alter it, give it a whole new dimension to experience, and while, of course, you know, a new new monster is perhaps always going to be more interesting, or at least perhaps preferable than a new version of an existing monster, I think there is certainly an element where if we didn't have subspecies, variants, rare species, etc., it would be a lot worse for it. A game with 25 new monsters and no new versions of old monsters, or a game with 20 uh, new monsters and 10 new versions of old monsters, well, I would choose the latter every time because I think it's really fun to see a creative twist on what's come before to make it not only a whole other world of fun, but a new hunting challenge dimension. Hunting challenge dimension sounds like the lamest concept for a monster hunter anime. Hunting! Challenge the mansion! <laughs> anyway, on that note then, I want to talk about, well, just that. Specifically, we're going to look at variants, and we're going to look at variants that we might still see in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak across the next title update, and if my running theory is correct, the one after that too. But we're not here to tinfoil. These would also be solid picks for Monster Hunter 6 and onwards if we do get these guys back. So, of course, I want to limit myself to picking from the existing Rise and Sunbreak roster. I also don't want to pick anyone that's already got another version. So, something like Ragnarokadaki already has Pyre, so we don't need to come up with something new for her. She got something. And hey, guys! I have been known to will these ideas into existence. Four years ago, I said... LIGHTNING ANGELA! And lo and behold, Fulgo was born, <laughs> and we won't look to all talk about the fact I said Lightning Edge Death probably won't happen, but hey, I uh, did this uh, little uh, think experiment for Icebond 2 with potential variants, and for some reason it involved a Rune and a Gigante in a car? Variants in a car. But that was a lot of fun as well, so uh, let's dig down into this and start with Gosrag. Yes, indeed. It's an absolute crime that he got nothing new, nout to do, no power boost in Sunbreak. I'd have taken a subspecies, I'd prefer a variant of rare, he needs some power! And the lightning is right. This has come up before, but I think a thunder, lightning, electricity-based Gosharag really has legs. But the thing is, we're talking variants here. So we're talking a uh, creation that can be recreated, that isn't a one-off freak occurrence like a deviant, but it isn't the standard form of the monster. It's not a group of subspecies that will always be this way. We actually do have to kind of justify this. I want to come at this from a, this could plausibly happen within the realms of Monster Hunter, as opposed to just being like, and then Thor doth give Mjolnir to Goss, and thus the greatest monster will was born. So, that said, I do love uh, this uh, concept for essentially just that by Heliolisk. So, for me, we have to go the lightning rod route. Lightning's propensity for striking conductive metal on the ground seems like the way to get Gosharag, well, infused with the stuff. Now, obviously, a animal, a creature being struck by lightning is more like to, you know, die than gain lightning powers, so we have to at least do a little bit of creative lightning. But how are we going to get a lightning rod on Gosharag? Well, Gosharag makes his hammery fists, he makes his ice swords, so he's fighting, he swings, he misses, and his ice sword crashes, like, into a cave wall, denting it deep, and he pulls the weapon away. And attached to it now is some ore, some metal ore that was in uh, the rock itself, and it's now clinging to it. He goes outside to continue the battle, raises his arm, and... Uh, well, there just so happens to be a storm above... And it has so happened to choose a host 
Thunder flashes, strikes the metal-coated ice blade, sealing it, melting the ore down, coating it, fusing it to his arm, and now he's walking around with a slab of crackling ice ore on his wrist, and his fur hued even more blue, crackling, standing on end, the static, he is suddenly very much in uh, control of his newfound strength. I realize, again, creative license here, but imagine a Gossarag that fights knowing that he can raise his arm into the air during a storm, lightning will strike it, and suddenly he'll have lightning blades, can sweep with them. He loses the ability to throw the sword, but he gains these arcing slashes of uh, pulsing power that can paralyze and such. That, I think, is badass, and I would call this Thundercrack Goss Harag. Though, of course, I would love to have your guys' input on the naming scheme here. I just kind of went with what felt right at the time. Next up, then, I want to look at Tetranadon, who, again, kind of got passed over along with Agnesom and Azuchi, but I think he, of all of them, could do with a bit of variant, and with him, I think the answer is rather simple. Tetranadon does two key things absorbs loads of water and gravel into his stomach to then increase his might, weight, and power to attack us. He then expulses all of that in a big beam of gravel and water to again attack us. Tetranadon, understandably, then has an incredibly resilient stomach. He uh, pulls up everything in the river, all the particles, probably little creatures, perhaps dirt, and so on and so forth. Lots of things you probably wouldn't want to actually ingest, but it doesn't matter because he's an incredibly resilient digestive system and a body that can handle it. So let's actually play with that. What if a Tetranadon learnt that if he hoovered up the right spot, he could actually get toads that were resting and sleeping, or at least hiding in and amongst the gravel under the river? Yeah, the blast toads, the sleep toads, the paratoads. And then once they get absorbed into his gargantuan gut, well, they're startled and they release their of blast, of sleep, of poison, and so on and so forth. But because Tetranadon can take it, he's got uh, the uh, body to handle it, it doesn't so much actually affect him, but it does transform the contents of his stomach to now being poison water, paralytic water, fiery crackly blast water. So it slightly tinges his colour depending on which frog he pulled up, and it means when he's bouncing around and shaking up the poor thing inside side of him, it's releasing more and more, and then his explosive final attack when he blasts it all back out, or indeed when we do enough damage and force it out, gets infused with the toad in question. So a paralytic yellowy water gravel beam, a poisonous uh, purpley water gravel beam, a uh, fiery powder, I realise it's mixed with water, but you know, you could make it work, and a fiery gravel water beam. I think that would be a lot of fun, and essentially he's just weaponizing toads deliberately because he has learnt as an individual that he can handle it. And that's something that not every Tetra would do, but something that every Tetra is capable of doing. And I would call this simply Glutton Tetranadon. Then we move to Garangome. This is, I think, an easier one because Garangome has an angry form. And a lot of times with variants, the way to go is we take the angry form and then we make it all of the time, and perhaps have an even angrier form! So we do just that, but we can get a little bit more creative. So we have him start with his big moss fist, big lava fist, with his moss uh, face, lava face, half and half combo, his super angry mode that he gets to once he gets low, that's beginning. However, we then have it go well to uh, its logical conclusion, and when he does his Big combo explosive rock crater attack. Tail to oh. you. That's the one. That's the one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. It's so cool. <laughs> He then completely covers the rest of him in this marbling of lava and water so that his entire body is this battle suit of moss and magma. And from then on, every attack 
is enhanced. He can do the rocket jump, but then when he lands, it careens water out. The water blights you and pushes you away, and the reverse as well. And we can even say uh, that because he explodes so deep into the ground, and perhaps we can have a Garangome that's ventured into the world, like a swampy area with like toxic water. We could have the mossy water actually take on a more poisonous uh, type of approach, but that's perhaps an optional. I'd call this deep growth. Garangome, as he has learnt that if he does, well, you know, do the whole body, he gets even more ferocious. And Garangome as a creature is one that keeps fighting no matter what, and the longer he fights, the angrier he gets. Basically, he works on Hulk rules. And with that in mind, you really can push the rage factor with him and uh, make his, like, gimmick mechanic the entirety of his being. I grant you this is perhaps the weakest of the ideas I'm presenting, but you can't tell me seeing a full body half and half moss lava garangome would not be amazing as long as he still has the single daisy growing out of his rump seriously go go check if you don't believe me Next up, then, we have Lunagaron. Of course, I want to touch on the Three Lords with this, and with Lunagaron, I quite like the idea of taking his functionality to take in air, hypercool it with a specialized organ, and then release it as a breath of frost, and also can use it to ice armor himself. If we have a essentially Frost Frank Barioth approach to Lunagaron, super freeze him, have one from the deep cold that returned, you know, that kind of variant explanation, and now we can turn his frost breathing powers up to 11. We still have his angry red veins, we still have his ice claws, we still have his general motif, but we give him a more savage edge. He's from a more brutal locale. He has to be much more, well, deadly to survive, much more ruthless. He's a werewolf amped up beyond bloodlust, and now he's faster, stronger, and more relentless. But the kicker is we really amplify that breath of frost because what it technically is is frosty mist he super cools the air you know when you breathe and it's cold and you can see your breath uh, for just a moment till it warms back up in front of you that kind of approach but we make him able to do it in massive amounts think Camellios when he mists up the area and then vision is obscured but now the entire zone you're fighting in thanks to this mighty huff and puff and blow the hunter's house down he has now filled the zone with this dense white frosty mist that does apply slowness to you that chills you that is a nightmare to exist in but also it blankets the place in cover so that the Lunagaron only given away by a glint of his eyes Nagakuga style can leap in and out of this new frost fog to do surprise claw attacks at you and you really do feel like you're being stalked and jumped at out of nowhere by this beastly werewolf. That, I think, would be utterly badass, and I would dub this Ice Cloak Clue Nagaron. But let me know what you think, of course. Then my final variant is one that I think we probably will get in some form, because if we don't, it will be a massive shame. I'm, of course, talking about Agnesom. <coughs> now, obviously, I am talking about Malzano, because, hey... When you kill guys, Magom, and you get the cutscene, there's the single main curio that flies away, and we're like, oh no! And now the swarm is everywhere. The affliction is everywhere. The maps are coated in them. It's bad. It's causing Risen Elder Dragons. It's causing Afflicted Monster. We're still unraveling this story beat through the title updates. We need a climax. We need an answer to the Curios. And what the Curios need is a new master. So, Host Lord Malzano. I know, it's a lame name, but Host Lord Malzano. Essentially a Malzano that has taken on Geismagon's job as he is able to symbiosis of the Curios, but now it's in a much more proper master and servant dichotomy with his full-on swarm and with that many Curios at his command, he no longer needs to power up to his Curio life enhanced state. He starts in it permanently in the black 
in feral nosferatu mode, and then he has one even beyond that that is the Host Lord mode, that is Super Ultra Mega Malzano, that is the Furious Rajang second layer of Enrage, the Savage Devil Joe second layer of Enrage, that kind of thing, the uh, true most peak power of Malzano with an entire swarm of curios at his command, not just the handful that he's currently working with. Oh, I can see that happening, and it would be just beautiful, and honestly is one of the biggest inspirations for this video, because I'll be very surprised if we at some point, even perhaps in the next title update, don't get ourselves a amped equivalent of Risen Malzano, but of course Malzano can't be Risen, because he is in control of the Curios, so a variant makes sense focused on them. Let me know what you guys think, though, of each of these ideas. Let me know which ones you would actually like, if any, and let me know what you would call them. And of course, any of your own ideas are always so beautifully welcome. For now then, like if you've enjoyed this, subscribe and hit the bell for more. Consider supporting the future of the channel on Patreon down below, and until we meet again, a god boy. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos, dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes, bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice, to reiterate that it is nice, to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage, is, uh, goodbye.